Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try and speak to you in the nicest possible way uh, after that lovely, warm introduction. Uh, and, and thank you very much to the Lloyd's Register Foundation for inviting me to be with you very briefly, I'm afraid, this afternoon. Uh, but nevertheless, absolutely delighted to be part of this important two-day event. Uh, and as Ruth said, uh, we think that's largely because there's quite a lot of synergy between the ambition of our two organisations and what we're trying to achieve. So in the next 25 minutes or so, what I'd really like to do is to describe uh, a little bit more to you about what we do and how we do it uh, in a way that I hope might inspire, uh, give some thought as to maybe some different ways of working in your own spheres. Clearly, I'm talking about collaboration in the energy industry as somebody who runs the Energy Institute as an organisation. But what we do can be applied in any sector uh, in a very similar way, using similar disciplines. So I hope that you will find it helpful. So let me start with what we're all about. So at the highest level, our ambition at the Energy Institute is that energy is uh, critically understood in terms of its role in the world, better understood, better managed and better valued. Those are the things that we're aspiring to achieve in terms of building uh, our role and making a contribution to society. And there's three key ways in which we go about trying to do that as an organisation. The first is by developing knowledge to help inform the wider debate, to ensure that public policy has got the sound evidence base that it needs. And in doing so, we're fulfilling our societal obligation as a benefit uh, in terms of our public obligations to exist as a charitable entity for the public good. We develop good practice, and I'm going to touch on this in more detail in a moment, to ensure that energy in all its forms is better managed. Supporting the industry, importantly, to improve health, safety and efficiency of operations, as well as environmental performance. All these things are critically important to us. And then we work to explain the role that energy plays in society so that it can be better valued. And we also work with the individuals who work within the industry so that they too can be better valued for what they do. We give them the opportunity to grow, to support their development and then be professionally recognised for that. And I'll touch very briefly on what we do there too. So in terms of scale and scope, we have about 23,000 individual members, many of whom are professionally recognised in the industry. We have 200 organisations engaged in the work that we do from all walks of life. About 40 of those are very much involved in the leadership work around our industry good practice and our collaboration model. Um, we also operate in more than 100 countries. So we're spread far and wide and with quite a small staff team. I have a staff team of about 75, uh, but I have a volunteer network, a community of over 2,500 people who engage with that staff team and they work in partnership to do all that we provide. So I don't expect you to be able to see the detail of this. What's, what's salient, what's important is the direction of travel, upward trends in three key areas, which again help to describe why it's important that we exist uh, and try and make a contribution to, raising, to solving some of the challenges that are out there. The world population is going to grow. We all know this, we all expect this to happen uh, from seven to around nine billion. Many of those people still do not have access to energy today, and many of those who will be on the planet still won't have access to energy, and that is a major challenge, as well as opportunity for us to address. So we know that energy demand is going to grow, and that underpins economic development, which we will need if we are to see societies benefit from enhanced technologies and opportunities and applications to take education, opportunity, uh, and society in general forward in a positive way. So we help in the context of the challenge of climate change, where we've then got to bring emissions down, uh, reduce the intensity of those emissions, and also reduce demand use for energy efficiency more widely, sorry, for energy more widely to encourage energy efficiency. We try to help societies through the industry to navigate those difficult paths. So it's an exciting and challenging time to be involved in our sector. So let me go straight to good practice and take a bit of a deeper dive, as I said I would. This is all about how we help people to better manage the energy. The guidelines in good practice that we produce are used globally. 
and that's at the moment they're used in about 98 countries so it's not quite world domination we've got some way to go uh, but clearly there is a there's an awful lot of activity currently for a relatively small organization our reach is fairly positive and powerful but we can always recognize that there's more to do so we have about 400 pieces of industry good practice we've got 350 odd test methods which are all about how you measure particular bits of product so that you can buy, sell, trade, deliver, transport, uh, and regulate. And we have uh, a significant network of committees and volunteers from our technical partners and other key stakeholders like the HSE, the Environment Agency, other regulatory authorities, uh, and also others who have a, an interest in seeing safety and global safety improvement, but not necessarily working at the front line in delivering that and making that happen. And so we tend also to work through other associations and in partnership with those organisations. And that helps to ensure that we also avoid any duplication of effort. Because again, like many sectors, it's not that significant in terms of the number of com companies that are engaged at a larger scale who tend to drive a lot of this work and create a lot of the opportunity. So collaboration is really important right across the board. And that's where we're a little bit different because under one roof we have the professional membership organization where we've got the individuals harnessing the expertise that they can bring we've got the learned society function which is in all about providing the public benefit and pushing information uh, and support out beyond the industry that we are working through and we develop this industry guidance which not many professional bodies and membership organizations actually do so we put that all together we cover the entire energy system on both the supply side and also the demand side through energy efficiency. We're a very broad church of members, so we can actually use our collaboration model to connect people from different parts of the energy world. So whether that's upstream or downstream oil and gas, thermal power generation, wind power, solar power generation, energy management, energy conservation, we can take people and put them together from those different sectors to look and share and learn around common issues, themes, and find opportunities to solve the challenges. We're not a lobbying organisation. We're not there to tell uh, those who influence the shape of the energy system or make policy decisions what they should do. But we will absolutely use our evidence base to explain to them, if you take a certain course of action, have you thought about A, B and C before you make that decision? Have you tried to anticipate what the unintended consequences of those decisions that you make or the trade-offs that you need to consider are? And that's the kind of role that we play. And that's where the collaboration ethos is so powerful. Because we don't have an agenda as an honest broker and a facilitator, it gives us a real opportunity to bring people together to get to the best answer. Either the best answer that the science can give us, the best answer that the available evidence can give us at the time. And I'll give you some examples of what that looks like in, in my world. So a lot of what we do around the safety agenda is about improving resilience in the energy system and supporting innovation. So again, very much in tune with the ambitions of, of the foundation uh, and the discussions that Ruth and I have had up to now. And some examples of how we do that in the energy sector through this collaborative model. So we work to underpin the processes that, for example, get aviation fuel from, as product from the refinery where it's produced through the distribution system that it needs to travel all the way to the airport and then onto a plane. So we're keeping 100,000 global commercial aircraft refuelling operations op happening daily, free uh, from contamination, from dirt, from water and any other contaminants that might be at risk of getting into the system. I think you would agree that's fairly important work to do. And as I'm about to go and get on a plane in an hour's time, I highly value the work that we do and I know many others do too and that's we are globally leading that work uh, most of which is used in the US because it's where the operators largely are based but we are the the provider of the guidance that makes that happen we also work on procedures for emergency response on solar panel fires uh, and also large-scale battery storage two more recent innovations in terms of technology application onto the energy system. But again, in terms of demonstrating and assuring the safety case, making sure that these technologies are being applied in the right way and put onto the system effectively and in a way that is resilient and is safe to do. 
Uh, there, there are issues that already are being identified which need to be addressed in order for that to continue to happen. So it's an, another example of more new energy technologies that are experiencing the same approach. We also do a lot of work in health. So, for example, we monitor in the industry, we've had two cohorts of people running for some 15 years now, actually, who've worked formerly in refining and storage and distribution operations within the industry, so have been exposed to benzene uh, over a period of time. And we've run cancer studies to determine whether or not that population is more exposed or otherwise to the general population. And thus far, that information then gets uh, published in medical journals and leading leading global uh, publications and thus far has we have proved that there is no significant difference of incidence between the two populations. We do a lot of work around uh, asset integrity, the protection of the bits of kit, the bit of infrastructure, the bits of plant, uh, the, 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 the structures that, uh, on which the industry operates and does what it does. And things, very basic things around, for example, corrosion management and, and protecting the, the, the facilities and giving them the longest life extension, protecting the, the integrity of those assets is incredibly important and also relates, obviously, to the protection of life too for some of those facilities, particularly where they are high hazard. We know, for example, uh, from our feedback from colleagues at the Health and Safety Executive in the UK through to the equivalent organisation NOPSEMA in Australia that this good practice is literally carried around in the bag for site inspections and pulled out on visits and discussed and talked about and used very much as the industry standard. Regulators pay a very important full role in what we do and we've built up a really good trusting relationship partnership with regulators around the world. So the guidance and the practice that we produce works through from design stage, construction, operations, maintenance, decommissioning, so the full life cycle of, of our world, if you like, the operations in our world. And as another final example, the Safe by Design workshops that we operate, we now run with the global offshore wind industry. And those are a great example of how the industry collaborates across itself and with others, collects important data and statistics, evidence of its own performance and where there needs to be improvement, and then identifies a work programme of industry guidance that needs to be developed in order to solve some of the challenges. So our ability to achieve this is really very much driven by those member engagements, those collaborations that we've got, working globally, uh, putting the members to, in, into action, as it were, uh, bringing them together and working with more than 40 organisations who drive a lot of the industry good practice work that we do, but a further 150 who are also engaged in communicating and pushing that information out and the members that we've got in more than 100 countries who also help us to promote uh, and share the knowledge around the work that we do. And that's a big part of our role, actually, to do the, the, the dissemination work. So let me see if this bit of technology works for us. This shows you a, uh, a graphic of where our material actually is being used. Much of it originally from the UK. We've been around for more than 100 years and 90 Plus of those, we were focused very much on working in the UK, and it's only latterly that we've been working more internationally. So in Europe, we see a lot around our offshore wind good practice, for example, and our test methods, our petroleum measurement work. In the Middle East, it's process safety and it's human factors in hearts and minds that is important. In India, it's refinery-related learning uh, and guidance and petroleum measurement again, as well as process safety. In Malaysia and Singapore, where we've got our newest operations, that's uh, lots of work around human factors, which is important in that part of the world. And in Australia, a number of, a number of topics which have become more important to, around process safety, uh, but also a lot around offshore and how offshore safety is delivered, particularly around remote operations and also working subsea. And in the US, as I mentioned earlier, I believe the, the, uh, the priority there is the aviation guidelines and the test methods. And you'll, you'll have seen from that map that there are probably dots that should exist uh, that don't currently. And that, for us, is, is huge opportunity uh, to do more, particularly in South America and also in Africa, who, uh, who are somewhat behind some other parts of the world. And this is how we're organised. 
So uh, this slide, again, I'm not expecting you to, to, to read all of the detail of it, but what it does show is that there, there are uh, a, a cluster of working groups. Actually, there are 100, well, just over 100 in total, uh, amongst all of those volunteers and experts from the industry and from other stake stakeholder groups that we pull together. And uh, we have got at least 40 companies now that are really taking and showing leadership in helping us to drive this work uh, and, and helping to contribute to its content, but also uh, its dissemination too, which is incredibly important. So Charles Darwin probably sums it up better than I could uh, in terms of why this is important. Uh, and I'll just uh, let you absorb that one for yourself. But essentially that word collaborate is really very, very much at the heart of what we do and makes us successful. And you don't have to take my word for it either, actually. Uh, in fact, it's important that you don't just take my word for it. Uh, every few years, we get our work or a, a section of our work independently audited. Uh, EY did the last audit for us. We describe it as a value study. So where we're approving probably anything between 30 and 50 projects, pieces of work a year, uh, at a point in time, EY would then come in and would audit maybe 13 to 15 of those projects. So it's not, the, it's not the work that said, what if an incident happened and you have managed to avoid it, the savings would be X, or you know, the, li the lives you would protect would be Y. These are actual tangible pieces of work where you can, you can measure and quantify the value. Uh, and by energy industry standards, and I suspect actually lots of other sectors too, uh, the, the, the validation for what we do that was come back to us says that the return on investment for every pound that's spent is either a spectrum of either 35 and for some projects through to 140 pounds and that's a pretty impressive return on investment uh, as I said certainly for the energy sector but probably for many others so uh, I'm not shy about that one. Just very quickly in the two other areas of, of what we do in terms of what makes us uh, unique as an organisation the second uh, of the three ways in which we fulfil our ambition, as I described to you, was around the work that we do on improving the evidence base and trying to contribute to uh, assist those who are making decisions about how the energy world uh, is organised and therefore what it is that the companies actually do and provide within the energy system and the industry itself. So we have quite a, a significant collection of uh, material, uh, again, knowledge that we've harnessed from working in collaboration with members uh, and with others too. Uh, we organise that both as a, a physical library, it exists, a physical information resource, but more and more so a digital one with lots of e-books and uh, a whole bank of material which we have moved into a digital format so that it's accessible. We then are able to monitor what sort of information and knowledge people are coming to us and looking for so that we can package collections of information to try and be more accessible, uh, make things easier for people to, to digest uh, and to make use of because that's what it's all about. There's no point in us sitting on this repository and having harnessed this knowledge and the value from the membership if we don't then work really hard to push it back out again because that's why it's so useful and that's what makes it so powerful. Um, and we, we, that's a continuous exercise. That, that's something that we, uh, we do on an ongoing basis uh, and then obviously have the responsibility to upkeep and maintain. Then we also produce a, a range, of, as you would expect most learned societies to do, publications. Uh, we've got some uh, peer-reviewed journal, but we've also got uh, regular magazines on different subjects that are, are provided for the membership, as well as information that goes out digitally uh, to uh, every time something new is produced or made available to the community. Uh, and those are, again, freely accessible to, to, to anybody that is interested to access them. And the other way in which we harness that knowledge relative to the, the, the policy process, if you like, and, and informing public policy, is that we work on an annual basis with a college, so a selection, a sample of our membership, statistically relevant sample of the membership, across different categories, across different sectors, bits of the energy system. And we ask them each year uh, about the things that are really worrying them, the things that they want to make sure those who are shaping and influencing the system are thinking about, uh, so that we can harness their voice, their collective voice, 
communicate that to people that need to understand the issues, uh, not just governments, you know, but, but, but principally uh, people who are working in, in uh, policy environments, clearly it's, it's useful. And we ask, and we start, the very first question that we'll start with is what are the, the things that are keeping you awake at night? What are your top 10 issues? And we look from year to year, and we're starting now, this is the third year we've done it, so we're starting to be able to see trends and movements from one year to the next. Uh, and we, we rotate half of that sample annually so that we also keep the, the, uh, the expertise and the opinion moving. Uh, this slide here is a, 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 a very quick heads up to the beginning of, of a set of information that will be launched next month, actually, in the 2018 Energy Barometer Report, which describes those top 10, it lists those top 10 issues. Uh, and uh, I, I guess the, the salient bit uh, for you in, in terms of the movement there is that Brexit is a big concern. And I guess from any sector that's uh, in the room today, that probably is similarly uh, a concern as we work through the process to understand what the impacts could potentially be. And the two new entrants to the top 10 for us in the energy sector in terms of the, the things that we want people to be thinking about are the impacts on people and skills. So our access to talent and to capability to do a lot of the things that I've just been describing actually, because it's getting harder and harder to get access to the expertise. And if, for example, the movement of people is limited uh, or restricted in some way, uh, or discouraged in some way, then we will find that for our sector will be a particular challenge uh, and is certainly one that people are worrying about currently. And the other one is we try and balance affordability with sustainability and with security of energy supplies is energy efficiency and conservation. And that's become a bigger priority for a lot more people. And again, there is a, a, a question mark over whether or not the policies are currently robust enough and whether or not more should be done. So it gives you an, an example of, of how we try and harness that information and share it. And finally, uh, the third, uh, how we do what we do, uh, was all around skills and the development of people and the recognition of people. And uh, one of the things that's really important to us then is training and development, continuing professional development. Uh, we work with uh, kids, so we will we'll go and talk to children about energy and environment, what they understand about energy and environment. We were at last month at the Big Bang Fair, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, where we have the promotion of STEM careers to kids uh, from the age of seven, although I was talking to a few four and five year olds uh, when I was there for the, for the day. But essentially, um, we spoke to 1,350 kids about what they understood about energy and environment. We've got some fantastic stuff, which we're going to be sharing later on in the year uh, in the form of some comic strips and a bit of fun. But it's some important messages about what the level of understanding currently is. Uh, greater than quite a lot of the parents, I have to say, which was um, insightful too. Uh, but we will, that's, we'll start at that end. Uh, and we will work all the way through supporting um, kids who are going to study. Uh, and thinking about a STEM-related uh, qualification, uh, or even a, a, a one, there are, there are several now that are around general management in the energy world, but it's traditionally been quite STEM-focused in terms of the, the undergrad education. Postgraduate studies, apprenticeships, will support people on all those journeys to help them navigate and find career paths and opportunities and make connections with mentors and others uh, to help them through their journeys as they develop careers, because obviously what we want to do is to attract and retain that talent into the sector. And then when they get there, we have a responsibility to support their personal development as, uh, as, as they stay with us. So the training becomes quite important. And training is also part of the dissemination. One of the things that we get told time and time again is that it's great to have things like the guidance material, but actually if we, if we can't have support with the how-to, implementing it on the ground, then we struggle. And that's another opportunity for us to think about how we can really expand our resources in order to make a difference. Uh, and that final slide before I leave you with uh, a, a short video just describes some of the ways in which we provide the professional recognition. So I would like to leave you with this video as a way of showing you how what the next step in our journey is to try and articulate how important safety is to people who don't necessarily help me produce all this material, but I want the wider public to understand the value of the role our organisations play.
thank you, Louise. I mean, I say thank you, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about everyone else. It's left me a bit gutted. <laughs> uh, um, so Louise has got to go uh, to the airport now. <laughs> and I wonder... If, so you won't have a chance to ask her any questions at the break. Um, so this is your, uh, your only chance to ask her some questions. So please, um, I'll open it to the floor. I've left everyone stunned. <laughs> you <Yeah. Sorry, laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned hearts and minds, and I wondered what your best practice um, recommendations are for that, and whether you advise on CSR for corporations in the industry. Yeah, the, the, the hearts and minds tool actually is a is a is a tool that we um, we took from Shell uh, as a company who had developed it and it's it's about winning hearts and minds to to really embed a safety culture within an organization so it has connections to the csr agenda but it's just very much driven from in in, in our sector safety is number one uh, as you've just seen you know it, it's life critical so it, it comes at it from that direction but you can very easily interpret it for other applications so for example we've just used it as the model for using it around energy conservation and winning people over on energy efficiency. So you could apply it to a CSR model as well, quite happily. Yeah. Hi. Um, you spoke about safety. Um, so basically you just advise the safety for the companies to then uh, implement it themselves. Um, because your, your role is to be uh, sort of advising uh, but impartial. My question is with regards to um, over the last few years, uh, with regards to mobile phones, um, there's always been a lot of articles talking about the the heat that comes out of the phone. Uh, you know, don't let the little children keep it. You know, keep the phone next to the ears because it's doing something to the brain. Um, but then recently, you've now got this progression to the smart meters. And the smart meters, a lot of people think it's just 1G up from 4G. But actually, the truth is, the scientific truth is, that it's 1,000 times stronger. And there's just two references I'd like to point out, which is uh, Barry Trower. He is Dr. Barry Trower, and he's XMOD. And he used to do research in this area, and he realized, what the hell am I doing? I'm creating a technology that's killing people. And then there's the Ramazzini Institute in Italy. They've released recently a study showing that cell phone towers, the masts, which are going to give us my, you know, our amazingly super uh, internet, so I can look at something which is pointless on my iPad, um, is giving people cancer. So this is something that most people do not want to hit because they're too much focused in the gadgets and devices, but is this something that um, is being heeded by people in the industry? Because I know there's a raft of scientists internationally warning this is dangerous. And what is your opinion on this? And this has become a very much an international issue as well, by the way. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much for your, for your comments and the, and the references. Obviously, my work is, is within the energy sector specifically, so we'd need to be talking to the equivalent in the telecommunications industry to get the direct answer to your question uh, to me. Um, uh, and so I, I don't know that one, but I can certainly uh, follow up and find out whether or not there are any references across our own work that link to wider work in the telecoms industry. I'm not personally aware of any. Uh, where we will interact on topics related to the one you've just commented on will be, for example, the use of mobile phones on, on petrol forecourts and whether or not there is an ignition risk and what the science is behind that. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we've also looked at exposure to certain uh, products such as benzene and whether that has a risk, uh, an increased cancer risk for the population that have been exposed to that as being part of the operations in the energy sector. So we touch on some similar topics to the ones you've referenced, but I can't answer your question directly because it's not my world. Uh, we'd need to try and find some references to, to any of the professional bodies that are working in the telecoms. In fact, the IET, the building that you're sitting in, may even have some of that that it would be worth exploring to get an answer to. Thank you. Is there a, a last question for Louise? 
for uh, Joyce. And I, I have a question, which is about your international collaboration. So you had a very interesting map that went mm. up and that allows you to see what the issues are that people in different geographies um, are interested in. Could you um, just give us some insights into you know, any challenges or the successes that you are having working internationally? You know, how, how are you mm. making that international move? Um, I think the challenges are respecting cultural differences. And, and those cultural differences have quite an impact on people's approach. Just take safety as the example. Uh, and also their, their regulatory environments. Mm -hmm. And when you put those two things together, that's where we then need to contextualise some of what we've done. Mm -hmm. So the mechanics of what we're producing in terms of what the guidance says you need to do mm -hmm. is still the right answer wherever you are, largely, because we're dealing with the same bits of kit, the same processes, um, there's people involved, at similar points in, in, in the activity. So there's a lot of uh, commonality, it translates fairly well until you come up against so things like hearts and minds and the, the, the lady's example to me earlier that's quite a tricky one to navigate we've got to really take on board what the cultural challenges are around say for example working in the middle east mm. that's going to be a different approach on the hearts and minds when we contextualize it to what we might do in australia mm. in respecting those cultural differences and the other one for us is a is a is an issue of scale where you know we, some of the harder to reach places that we can't get into require translation of the materials, which is quite an expensive thing to do. Mm. But I would like us to do a lot more of what you just saw at the end there. And some of the guidance that we've done has been visual. So we, rather than use words, we've used pictures mm. so that we can cross language barriers and, and, and reach out that way. And there's a great potential if we could work at a larger scale to be able to push much more out mm. using those kind of techniques. Super, okay. Well, thank you very much, Louise, and thank you for coming and being our keynote. Good to see you. Thank you.